G'day, everyone. Alex here, and welcome to episode 177 of the Trade Mate Sports Betting Podcast. Yes, it's been a long time since we've done a podcast, but what better way to be back than to introduce professional sports better, Jake Humphreys. How are you, mate? Hello, I'm good. How are you going, Alex? Very good, mate. Like I just said, it's been a while since we've done a podcast here, so please uh, go easy on me if I ask some terrible questions or there's some technical difficulties. We'll see how we go. I'm not a... I'm feeling the least confident I ever have been in a podcast. <laughs> well, that's a good way to set the expectations really low. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, it works. It, it works in all facets of life. Always set them low, and uh, people will be surprised with, uh, <laughs> how good you can go. Uh, mate, why don't we just start off with the most basic of questions? Uh, what got you to where you are today in the in the sports betting industry? Oh, I think. Well, I don't know how most people start off but for me it just began with a love of sport in general and um i suppose i just started like i had a lot of years where i wanted to just punt recreationally like i think that i started betting when i was about 19 and i'm, I'm pretty sure that for 80 percent of that time i was a really really bad punter um and i think that is the case with a lot of people who started off like me um just watching rugby league and tennis and and gravitated to betting on the sports that i enjoyed watching which again that might not be the best way to to oftentimes you like watching the sports that are hardest to beat right yeah like i think that yeah. like the the badminton specialists out there i don't know if they started watching badminton and then started betting on it or they wanted to attack it because they thought it was vulnerable like tennis and rugby league my two favorite sports um and i started betting on those um and i i think honestly like to say a lot of trial and error throughout the uh the early parts and the middle part of my, my punting career and i think even now like you look at everyone does this but i suppose the more you learn the more you realize you don't know and looking back at what i was doing even two three years ago very skeptical about my methods then I think I'm at a point now where I'm pretty comfortable betting on the stuff that I'm betting on. But yeah, to answer the question, like it, ju it just started by watching it, betting part time, generating a bankroll, and then getting to a point now I'm 30. So I've been betting for over 10 years. So getting to a point where you're comfortable with your methods, what you're doing, and, and, and you're sort of ticking over a profit, which is, which, which is nice, but it's always challenging. So yeah. And from talking to you before, you've got pretty similar methods for both betting on tennis and rugby league so it's not like you know one sport you're using a model and the other one you're steam chasing or something like that you've got a yeah a similar method for both for both sports and i guess it kind of derives from from what you just said watching these sports and then being your favorite sports from a from a well for a long time now so do you want to just um yeah give everyone a great a brief summation as to your exact process when it comes to betting profitably on those two sports yeah, well, I, I think for a while I looked at like people who made advanced models and did computer science and were Excel wizards. And I looked at that and I thought of that as like the holy grail of sports betting. And I'd watch some YouTube videos where people had said, you're not going to win against at least liquid markets anyway, like your tennis sides and your rugby league sides, unless you're, you're modeling. I'm quite sure that's not true. Um, I don't know if I, if my sample sort of proves that i'm still i guess wrestling with the possibility of beating liquid tennis and rugby league markets uh long term and we'll get to that later but i figured if i was going to sit back and try to train myself at 28 or 29 to make a new model or whatever when i have very little pre-existing knowledge about anything to do with coding or excel or anything i thought you know why bother like through watching so much sport and watching so much of tennis and rugby league, I do believe there are things that you can pick up that the market doesn't quantify, the market doesn't consider. And obviously the great thing about our position as a punter is that, you know, they have to put up markets for 50 tennis matches a week, more 200 tennis matches a week. We only need to bet one or two. So you find a situation where a particular player has to do something that's very physically, emotionally, mentally demanding, and you attack that spot and there's there's many factors you know ones that i can get into at any point i mean for a good example in tennis is the unique thing about tennis is that you have to play all over the globe you have to travel a lot and sometimes those that those trips are very demanding so someone might have to go from from north america 
to Japan overnight. They get bounced out of a tournament in, in New York and then they have to qualify in Asia the next day. That's not something that always happens. It doesn't happen very often, but there are instances like that where I still don't believe the market correctly assesses those types of um, challenges placed on an athlete and you learn which players are going to be more, um, I guess, adept at handling situations like that. And in rugby league, there's probably not as many situations like that because the schedule isn't so unique and so global. Um, but that's just an example of, of the kinds of qualitative things that I use when betting on rugby league and tennis. Like there are, it's very, very little stats work. It's probably, it's probably 90% um, percent qualitative and 10% just using the stats that I have to reinforce my position, making sure yeah. that I'm not going mad. Um, and of course, I'm making my own prices as well. Um, but sometimes I'm not. Sometimes I'm not. Sometimes it's just um, it's just me assuming that in a particular situation, the market hasn't correctly weighted the factors that I'm that I'm looking at. Um, and you can't get to a point of betting like that overnight. Like that comes through watching these types of things heaps of times over. So I've even, I've forgotten the root of the question, but hopefully I've answered it in some <laughs> in some way. <laughs> no, no, no. I think you've perfectly explained. I guess your your betting process. You're not. You know, you are handicapping, but or you are an originator, whatever you want to call it. But you're not exactly. Yeah. You're not modelling. Like I would. I would say that. Oh, I don't know. I would I would assume that maybe like eighty to ninety percent of originators out there are using some sort of model. That is like that could be so wrong, but that's just you know. I think that's, I think that's about right. Yeah, I think mean, that's I, about right. I I yeah, when I when I you know have originated um, in MMA or UFC, I find myself. You being... can't model that, can you? <laughs> well, no, no. no. I, there are people that model it, but I, I yeah. think that's the one sport where I know that most people wouldn't model it. Yeah. But I'm just saying that um, when I tell people that I originate and that I don't use a model or, you know, I don't have any kind of Excel spreadsheet skills and all this kind of stuff, people are, are generally surprised, I guess. They just assume that if you're originating that you've got some kind of whiz-bang model. And I think... Yeah. I think there's obviously pros and cons with every kind of uh, style of origination, but the I, I would say that uh, I don't. It's hard to say, but in a way, the whole like I call it like I guess game analysis handicapping, if you want to call it that. It's 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 reasonably timeless in the sense that like models can always have to be updated, whereas your brain it's it's all kind of in your brain and yes you have to update your brain too but it's not as like one day you've just completely lost your edge if you know what i mean whereas that can happen on a model where literally overnight you can go from a plus ev punter to a, a negative ev punter do you have any thoughts on that yeah i i think that i think people are they are well within their right i think it's totally justifiable to be totally justified to be skeptical of someone who basically says, "Hey, look, I just eyeball sports and I win." Yeah, I, and I and I I think that there are an array of sports that you will not be without inputting a certain amount of you know mathematics, modeling, coding. I think like if 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 someone tells me that they get out the blackboard and they're handicapping NFL and they're beating it game day without a model, like that is like one in a million. <laughs> That's one in a million. And and I and I. I mentioned something briefly before when I was speaking. It's like, I'm not going to sit here and say that the qualitative stuff that I do is good enough to beat game day tennis over a 2000 bet sample at five or 6%, which is just, that's a, that's elite. Those are elite results, right? I, I'm quite confident that I could do it at 2%. My data shows that I could do it about 2% beat game day liquid tennis markets, rugby league as well, possibly a little bit higher. Um, but it's like, is it even worth doing it like that without a computer, without a model, when you've got to throw in like the emotional tax as well? Um, yeah. Um, but obviously, I've done a good job at punching down and betting on the markets that are more beatable while I've still got the account access and while it still makes a difference financially. Like the, the MMA would be a good example. Like you, I know that some soft bookmakers offer markets like mm. fighter A, significant strikes landed. And some yeah. of those markets are just like the people who have made those markets have just rolled out of bed and just thrown a dart at the board. Like they've got no clue, but you can't get yeah. set, right? But your 
your objective is for as long as you can to punch down and to get good feel on those markets and then even everything out with the liquids where you might win, I suppose, at a lower clip. So I just want to like be on the record saying, hey, I'm not some qualitative guy who can just eyeball Wimbledon head-to-heads and chop it off. Um, but, yeah, like there is – there's very little – um, very little technical stuff, uh, I guess, numerically happening on my end. And, and do you agree with like using the strike, significant strikes um, as an example, something like that with the M- with MMA, where you know those are certainly exploitable. Oh yeah, I mean that, that's the softest of the softest markets. Sure, there's Good not to many use extremes though. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's. Uh... I mean, there's only probably off the top of my head two or three bookmakers that, that have those markets in Australia, and when you when you go to exploit them, it's uh, it's pretty hard to get more than a hundred bucks or something <laughs> yeah, down on them yeah, before yeah. it goes into review. So yeah, um, but no, I I would say, I mean, this is going off off the um, off the track a little bit, but for anyone that's beginning originating, it's it's so important to to start with the softest of soft markets. Yeah, you're not going to, you know, get as much yes. down on those markets, but most people who are starting originating probably don't have a big bankroll anyway. And to to start with markets that are like, as you said, blokes are putting these out that have just rolled out of bed. Like, no, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a great way of putting it because, I mean. They, yeah. They don't many... have to have a clue as well because the, no. the, the takeout, like the, the market limits on those particular fixtures are so low, they can afford to put an intern on it or whatever they're doing. Obviously, that's not it's not happening in that particular way. But you can't win a lot on it. But a hundred dollar a hundred dollar fill for a day one originator, it's 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 substantial. Oh, um, yeah. And and you've got to you've got to sift through all that filth when you first start betting. And another thing as well, I think one of the most overlooked practices for a punter day one or experienced is to paper trade. Paper trading is like the best thing you can possibly do. And for people who are like, well, what's paper trading? You get a spread, you get an Excel spreadsheet, you get a template. You don't have to, you don't have to make the spreadsheet or you can get a bit of pen and paper, whatever. And uh, put, put bets on, but don't put them on with real money. Just put them into your sheet and say, hey, this is what I would have bet on and rack up a sample of a thousand or 1500. And if you didn't know if you had an edge betting on a certain sport or market type, you will. Once yeah. you finish your paper trading, and if you do your life, it's not going to cost you a cent. Like, that's something I learned a couple of years ago. It's like I think paper trading is so good. So if you start betting, you 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 punch down, you bet on the stuff that you can you can win at double figure POT and and on the side paper trade the, the more liquid stuff, the scarier stuff, and see if you've got an edge. Yeah, no, it's interesting, mate. I think it's definitely something that people can do it's just a matter of uh who wants to like yeah oh, <laughs> I, can un- I can understand if like someone like you let's just say that you you know you're professional better betting on rugby league or tennis or whatever and you're betting just props let's just say and then you know five minutes every day you just jot down the money lines you liked or the you know the big market stuff that you liked and then that's not you know too much of a hassle for you whereas you know if someone's like you know, just paper trading, they're not doing anything else, then I would assume it's going to take a decent chunk out of their day and it's going to probably, um, you know, most likely in most cases, if they're not putting in the research too, they're probably going to find out that they're actually not that good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. And, and to you know, um, people like having skin in the game, people like action, people yeah. like ac- actually laying money down. So I get that. But if you if you can work it in at some point throughout your punting, I think mm-hmm. it's a great idea to do that. Yeah. Oh, no, 100%, mate. No, I agree. So let's just go through. Why don't we just start talking about, I guess, let's just talk about tennis for a, yeah. f- first and then we can go into rugby league later. Yeah. Um, just so we can kind of delve into exactly kind of what your, you know, you see a match, Nadal versus Federer, even though they're both retired now, terrible example what's the you, you know you maybe are you looking at all the matches on a daily basis or are yes you, you are okay and so yeah, you so, like a match let's just say you like Nadal yeah. and Federer you like one side or whatever you like what do, what are you what are you doing from there well typically if I'm looking at like a daily tennis card of 40 or 50 matches the ones that I'm going to like are the ones that don't stand out so like this is the thing like if I am in communication with a mate and I said hey they say hey what do you like in this Aussie Open and I'm like oh, I can send you some tips no worries I'll send them four on day one and the players that 
are involved in the match will be playing on like court 50 out, you know, out near the street, basically. Like you'll <laughs> never find me betting heavy into a final between Federer and Nadal. It's a great example for you to use to so that people can understand. But for me as a punter, like I, I'm not, I've seen too many horror stories and lost too many bets to look myself in the mirror and say, yeah, I'm going to have a full feel on someone in a Wimbledon final unless I have an opinion that's just really, really overwhelmingly strong. You know what I mean? So first things first is that I'll look and, and people like Federer and Nadal, that um their data is so well exposed, their personality is so understood by the market, they're very unlikely to have shortcomings that the market doesn't see. I will pinpoint a match between two players that maybe the market doesn't understand as much. A good situation is probably a player who in the last two or three weeks has overachieved as uh, overachieved market expectation drastically. Potentially had to do a couple, make a couple of flights from country A to country B, and I think maybe that short-term success has been weighted too heavily into the market. So the market's behaving very reactively. This person might have an average SP of of X, and match one in this tournament, it's looking a lot shorter than what it traditionally has been. So you zoom out and you say, well, what this person's done in the last two years is actually much more relevant than what this person has done in the last two three weeks. This is short-term variance. The opponent has had a pretty soft schedule. Yeah, they've had some losses where they were unlucky on break point or whatever, but they're presumably healthy. They've had less time, less travel time in the last two or three weeks, a less rigorous schedule. Let's bet on that person at odds against. And, and those are the type of fixtures where I've had the most success on. And they're the type of fixtures where if, if I got, you know, if it, you want more of them, right? Like I think I've probably come unstuck over the years, forcing action a little bit and trying to bet later into tournaments. But the best spots and the seasoned tennis bettors will probably agree with me. The best spots is where you've got characters like that who maybe the market doesn't quite understand and and, and they're very vulnerable in certain situations. So, yeah, what I just outlined then is an example of how I would approach a matchup, yeah. Yeah, so you... Are you allocating percentages to players or I guess you're probably betting into the prop markets too? How are you are you sitting down and going, yeah, percentage for each of these two? Or are you just or are you more so looking at two players and going, two ten doesn't look right for this guy? I reckon he should be two or one. It's nine. funny. It's funny because like if you answer and say you're not assigning percentages to every matchup, people look at you and think, well, some people look at you and think, oh, you know, amateur hour. But I have you you gain an understanding over a long period of time watching thousands of matches pulling god knows how many all nighters you gain an understanding of someone's average sp and the expectation they have from the market and you more or less know when their price is in line or out of line with that don't get me wrong there are certainly instances where there's I've got a a flaw for a player as far as the price goes, and I won't take it if they go below that, or I really think, hey, look, this player's up against it. You know, it ticks all the boxes, like the boxes I've just mentioned, but the market knows the price just isn't right. So I'm, I'm not going to bet on it, right? Like if the price isn't there, if, isn't there I'm not going to bet on it. Um, before like a first round of a Wimbledon or a US Open and the draw comes out, I do do a bit of percentage allocation, make some prices and give myself a, 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 a sort of a rough expectation of where I think the prices will land. But if I told you that I was betting heavily off percentages, Kelly Criterion, you know, here's my price. It's X different to the house price. Let's make a bet like that. I'd probably be lying. I don't do a lot of that anymore. Um, A a useful um, instance where you can do that is betting on the futures markets. I think it's probably a little bit um, more practical. At least I use it more betting on the futures markets. One of the one of the easiest markets to beat in tennis is the quarters market, but it doesn't get offered um, as much as I would like. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, like the, the, there is certainly, I'm certainly making prices here and there, but as I have familiarized myself with the tennis marketplace more and more in the last two years, I've, I've kind of steered away from doing it. My results have gotten a little bit better. Maybe I'm getting lazy. Maybe that's not something that... Um, you should be doing, you should always have prices to fall back on. People have said that to me before, it's dangerous. You should always have prices to fall back on. The reality is of life is that without modeling, without a machine spitting out a price for you, it's very, very difficult to come up with 20 prices a day at least. So I just don't do it. 
and I and I look at I, I look at flash score and I'll set all my matchups, and I'll pen ninety percent of them. I won't even look at them because I just think I oh, I know where that where that player's been. I know what that market expectation is for that player, or maybe um, that player grays me up. I don't know how to read them. I've got a personal yeah. bias for them or against them that I that I don't trust myself to override. Like all those sorts of things. So and that all takes time. So to put it simply, I don't really have time to make make prices for every matchup. Yeah, can you give me an example of a player that you have? Uh, we'll go on the negative side. Yeah, well, maybe not negative side is the wrong way of putting it, but a player that you always price differently compared to the market, and you're either consistently wrong or right about that player. Nick Kyrgios. So it's a good it's it's a good example because he's he's a very um, I don't think anyone could price that fella. <laughs> no, no. So maybe it's an obvious, maybe it's an obvious example. But like I've done a lot of losing betting against Nick Kyrgios because yep. I had this, and I was wrong. Like this is where I had an internal bias against a player, and I didn't understand. Uh, I guess there were times where I just completely misread when he was going to show up and when he wasn't going to show up. But I got so caught up in the commentary and in the criticism and in that this guy, um, you know, isn't dedicated or whatever. And then he'll turn up out of nowhere and he'll go and win a, a 500 tournament and play his absolute heart out. Um, Nick Kyrgios is an example, like someone who's really, really volatile, but I just wasn't able to go against him when he was losing and I wasn't able to get with him when he was winning. And then it got to a point where Kyrgios would have a match up. And I was so I had so much PTSD about my ability to assess his matchups that I just penned anyone he penned every matchup that he was involved in, and people would have said to me, "Oh, you know, should you really be doing that?" Like, I, I'm I'm certain people would have snickered at that when I said, oh, "I'm just not going to get myself involved in curious matchups." But when you're betting qualitatively and you're sort of wearing your heart on your sleeve a little bit, and you're having to watch these matches and death ride them a little bit, it can be like emotionally plus EV to just say. Get, let's get this guy out of my sight for a couple couple months, couple <laughs> tournaments. Yeah. Um, because I just my, my, I wasn't able to ass, assess him objectively anymore, especially moving forward. And if you do a bunch of money on a player, you sort of want to get it back, you know, ag against them. All these little things are just so dangerous for a qualitative guy. So, um, cu yes, Curios would be an example of someone who I've read incorrectly. I've lost money and then maybe I've tried to chase betting against him more. Or I've tried to involve myself in his matches more just to, to, to show myself that maybe I do have an assessment. And you take one step down that path and, and, and you can, you're betting way too emotionally. Like there's a very fine line. So, yeah, Nick's probably an example of someone I just never figured out. Yeah. Was, is there a particular uh, thing that you got wrong about him? Like is it his emotional state or is it more so like, you know, his forehand is not as it's it's a lot better than I thought it was. Like, is it X's and O's or is it something no. emotional? He is the most unpredictable athlete I've ever dealt with. In the fact that there are all of these indicators that will help you determine when a player is going to arrive at a tournament with a level of motivation that maybe others don't see coming, and it's where like punters like me feel like they can get an edge. Like, for a good example is like. If you're from Argentina and you get an opportunity to, to play in Cordoba or something like that on clay, usually that player is going to have a real crack that week, right? They're going to, they're going to pour their heart out. They're going to give maximum effort. They're going to chase balls. Nick Kyrgios could rock up to an Aussie Open round one or Wimbledon round one and lose as a $1.10 shot in straight sets. And then he could go to a tournament two weeks later much lower profile, much less perceived motivation, at least from where I'm sitting, and and play a really, really tidy match. There, He doesn't go by the traditional indicators of what would motivate somebody. You know, people say Nick likes the big stage. He does like the big stage. I mean, who doesn't? But I would wager that his ROI in quote unquote big tournaments isn't actually as plus as what he's just all over the shop is the easiest way to put it. Like it's yeah. Yeah. Try, trying to find out when a player is going to be motivated, ready, fresh. They're things that I think that I can do. And other players have more predictable personalities than others. Nick's personality is something that I never, ever got a hold of. I could never figure out and still can't figure out when he's going to actually rock up and have a go. Yeah. Nothing will predict that. No. Yeah. 
So when you're, I guess, as I said before, when you're when you're looking through the, you know, twenty or so tennis matches every day, you've, uh, I mean, maybe it's not a good example pre-tournament, but let's just say we're heading into day two, day three, mm -hmm. and the markets are, I assume, reacting to what's happened in the previous matches. I also assume that you haven't been able to watch every single match that's been going on. So if you see a price that you go, hmm, that's interesting, I like this guy on day four of a tournament, do you then go back and watch the game that he just played or are you watching as many games as possible live? No, I, I'm, I, I did a lot of live tennis watching like – Back breaking overnight tennis shifts between like 2019 and 2022, where I tried to absorb as much of the information as I could. I was watching blow by blow. I was death riding. I was absorbing all this information. You just won't last doing that. Like, I don't care what anyone says. Like, that kind of behavior becomes very, very taxing, especially when you get older and stuff like that. It's like, I can't do this anymore. I did absor I absorbed so much information about a, a, a group of plays throughout that period of time, and I absorbed so much information about the tour and all these different courts and all these different services and countries and matchups and all that sort of stuff. Nowadays, if I if I see it like a, a an eyebrow raising price, what I do, I mean, I'm lucky, and people have got to behave like this. You've got to make connections. Like if if I didn't watch it, I've got a sharp mate who did. Like, if I didn't watch it, there's someone on Twitter who I chat to who, yeah, mate, I caught that game. Here's what happened based on my observation. This is why the price might be like that. Go check it out for yourself. And then you'll go have a look and you'll say, oh, well, maybe the player who I want to bet against, maybe he converted two out of two break points and his opponent only converted one out of eight. Those little, you know, micro occurrences that are extremely high variance but do play a role in predicting a match, right? Um, first serve percentage, another thing that's relatively high variance can, you know, it's relatively, um, can be pretty luck based if someone is quite unquote like on, like what Nick Kyrgios can be, where he's just pinging in first serves that, that will tend to regress. So you look at things like that and that's where you start to think about forming a position, even though you haven't watched ball by ball from the previous match. But I have no doubt that if I was watching all of the matches today, while I would be a lot more tired <laughs> I potentially would be able to, to 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 make some better reads, maybe. But as I said before, like my focus today uh, on the tennis market isn't necessarily to dedicate and and put all my chips onto into beating beating the liquids, beating the the game day head to heads and stuff like that. So I'm not up all night watching watching the matches and stuff like that. I still do um, um like paper trading on a couple of different websites where I'm tracking my results and it's telling me how I'm performing and I'm not even betting on those picks a lot of the time because I, I don't think it's um, money well spent at the POT that I'd be winning at, which is one or two. So, Yeah, okay. And generally tennis, there's been studies, not recent studies because I haven't really involved myself much in tennis betting in recent years, but maybe five, four or five years ago where, you know, there's been uh, – analysis done around CLV when it comes to tennis and how it's not exactly predictive or the market's not as sharp as, you know, this is a bad example because of course, but it's not as sharp as like your English Premier League or closing lines or it's not your NFL closing lines, these kind of things. So um, how do you assess your bets? Do you assess your bets based on beating closing lines or do you assess it based on watching the game and seeing how it plays out and trying to eliminate um, high variance outcomes, I guess you could say, or I guess the best way, it, if there's like an expected goals of tennis, if you know what I mean, so you can go and look back at the game and go, okay, I bet Arsenal at, at 2.0, they got, three more expected goals than the other team. Although the, my bet lost, it was clearly a very good bet. I think you'd have to be quite bullish to sit back and lose against the close, so not attain CLV or at least go flat on EV, right? Yeah. Um, for a long period of time, lose money or chop out or whatever and say, oh, well, I still think that you can win. Like my answer is a relatively conservative answer, but I've not seen in the last two or three years anybody generate a long sample 
on liquid. When I say liquid game day tennis, this is this is the holy grail. And I do think that this market has caught up to some of the other mainstream sports in the last, you know, two years. I, I think it actually is pretty legitimate now as far as its efficiency, especially on game day. Obviously, if you can knock off early lines that go up 48 hours out from the off or when a matchup is newly formed where player A won one matchup and player B won another matchup, some soft books will throw up. Yeah, we can all we can all knock those off, right? We can all win. It just comes down to volume. But I've not seen anybody in the last two years win at a respectable POT on genuine tennis markets without the, the EV line going up. So I would probably dismiss anyone that said, hey, I've put together 2,000 bets betting head-to-heads game day men's ATP. Um, I've got no EV or CLV to show for it, but I'm winning at 7%. I'd be like, well, where's the sheet? I need to see it. I don't think it exists. Like, okay. I mean, there'd be and, – and I hope guys comment on this and I hope someone says, hey, here's this sample that I can show you from 2022 to 2024. But well, a great example is in recent, the story. I don't yes. know if you ever – read that i'm so i'm familiar i'm familiar with his work and nishikori is obvious i wish he'd put his put a face to a name the only face <laughs> i ever see is a digitally generated one like hey, come mate, on bro get on a could, podcast or something it could be nishikori it could it, be him. It, it, well that would explain why the drop off in in real tennis because he's been punting but look nishikori <laughs> is a good example and like this is why when i said just now on in the last two years i was i carefully said that because nishikori um, his data is propped up by a superb run between like 2018 and 2022 or something like that. If you look at what he's done in the last two years, and again, I don't, he, he did stuff that um, I, I, I couldn't do. It's, it's a very, very, very savvy punter, but it, there's a plateau in the last two years. The, the chart is flat in the last two years, and I think I think he's lower now in our, our like POT or, or, or stakes profit now than he was at he at a peak in 2022 so it's a flat line right but that is it's certainly curious how he was able to pass the p-value test basically from 2018 to 2022 so he was at a point he was at a point where he was good not lucky the sample size was big enough to iron out the variance yeah. he wasn't getting any clv but he was winning great it was it's spectacular, but I I don't it's not happening anymore, and I think that's because the market's gotten sharper, and I don't know if he could ever do that again, and I haven't seen anything else like that. It's possible it's just some sort of anomaly. I, I don't think so. I think he had an edge. I think what he was doing, I think his methods were working throughout that period of time, but you know people like that. If you if you win at six or seven percent without beating the market, eventually the market is going to catch up to those methods. The person who's betting is going to start betting more volume and they're going to start to have more of an influence in the closing price. So someone like Nishi, mate, by the end of it, he would have been betting 10, 20K bricks. By the end of that betting run, he, he, the market is so reflective of his opinion that it's just impossible for him to get that edge anymore and it, it erodes and I think it has eroded. He's certainly still got some sharp takes and all of his content is just bang on. But like, yeah, he's not winning anymore. So yeah, no, it's it's super interesting because that kind yeah. of, or at least you know, when I was getting more into the tennis betting, maybe three or four years ago, that was like the, it was almost like a known thing. Like you don't have to beat the market in tennis to be to be profitable. But um, it's interesting to hear your take on things. You know, two three years down the road, and how that how that may have changed, and how like you know, arguably one of the bigger tennis betters um in the world has uh you know his results have had some kind of you know downfall or not maybe not downfall but they're not as profitable as they used to be so yeah well, the, the, all the people who say to me i don't think you need CLB to beat tennis is like so anecdotal the commentary that i receive it's like okay well you know that's fine you've got the opinion um Where's the data set to show me that you've done it or that someone close to you has done it and it's like oh well i think well, that that's the thing like a lot of people it's just super anecdotal. Like a lot of people make claims without being able to cite a set of results or being able to like it's only Nishi. That's the only person I've seen with a, a, a real sample of at least a thousand bets where I've seen yeah. someone's actual chart go up, but the expected line stays the same. So yeah. it's interesting, man. Like I don't think it can happen anymore. Um, but if 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 it is happening, I'm keen to see it.
Yeah. And and for yourself, are you, yeah. let's just say, I assume you've probably got about a day or so. But yeah. To, so, especially in these um, especially in these smaller tournaments, you've probably got a day to look at a match or at least a day for almost 24 hours before a match until it starts. Are you betting as soon as the market opens? Yeah. yeah. You're- so I, yeah, my, my, yeah. Well, if, if I'm not, then I'm sort of, if I'm not, I'm hinting that I can't win at all because I've just gone on this tirade about needing to, to <laughs> attain. Set. So I bet as early as I can, Pinnacle markets sometimes go up 36 hours, 48 hours if you're lucky before the match. Limits are low, obviously. They, they progressively go up closer to the off. But I I try to get there and I try to click really early and and see how the, the lifespan of that market actually progresses and give myself an opportunity to get ahead of the market. And in instances where I can highlight something that I like sort of two days out, um, I do feel like I'm I'm getting ahead of the market more often than not. But yeah, like you, I've got to give myself that opportunity. So I'm trying to bet early. I'm trying to bet early and, and see the price actually move. Mate, I very rarely, very rarely bet bef- before the coin toss. And if I am, it's because someone's drifted like mad and entered a price or I want to have a nibble. But like all, all most of the good stuff or the stuff that I would recommend to others is is, is on opening price and a day out. And then people are going to say, oh, well, that's not that's not legitimate. How can you get on for volume? Well, I don't get on for volume. You know, I'm not betting like <laughs> stacks, game day liquids. I'm betting service, service break markets. I'm betting quarters. I'm betting outright markets. Yeah. And I'm betting early. You know, you, you add it all up and you can make a good earn. But, yeah, I'm not betting those huge market moving amounts on game day. Not yet anyway. And if, and if you can share, you don't have to, but how much, I'm not asking how much do you bet on, on like a, an immediate release tennis, but how much do you think, let's just say, you know. Bet to win about, to win about to 2K. Very, you can bet, bet to win if you've got a good good array of accounts. Yeah, bet to win about um, on, a, on a good on a good early release head to head, bet to win about two or three K AUD. Yeah, provided provided yeah. I, I got the accounts there, which I normally do. So yeah, that's 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 about that's about where I'm at, which isn't nothing, but it's also no. not your your not your three, four K click penny where you just these yeah, you know, bigger joints are just spamming it and they're they're getting on at all the soft books as well. No, like if I like something, I'll try to get on to win two and two or three um K and that's and that's that's more than what I can get on t- if I'm like a really good earner for me is service break markets. But you can imagine that's like the equivalent of a um, significant strikes or whatever or takedowns for MMA. For like, you can't get on. Um, but you know, if you're resourceful and you're on the ball, you, you can you can get on to make it like a tangible difference in in, in your day to day life because those ones go at, at at huge clips. Yeah, ones like yeah. that. All right, mate, let's shift over to your rugby league betting. Yep. Uh, a little bit different in terms of how many games there are every week compared yep. to tennis. And I would assume if you are um, if you are watching all of the games, it would be a lot less time consuming. Is that your approach there too, is to watch? Are you watching all the games live or catching up on them later? Yeah, I don't miss the rugby league game. Like I won't miss one. Like I'll, I will – because it's like it, – I've fallen out of love a little bit with tennis in the last couple of years, and obviously the schedule is so demanding, but rugby league is something that I could watch without having a penny on. Tennis at a pinch, yes, but the reason I'm so invested in tennis like emotionally is is linked to the betting side of things, but rugby league is like I've just always watched rugby league, and it's something that I'm I'm interested in, so I'm, I'm not going to – I don't think I've missed a game. Like, I think that it'd be an absolute night, nightmare for my missus. But, like, on a Saturday, for example, um, it's just on. Like, I just I just don't – I just don't – I don't miss rugby league games, which makes it um, – it, it, it makes it a lot less draining to allocate prices to teams and players and go about your betting process because it's so fun. It's just so fun for me. Yeah. It's like you're betting on your passion, right? And, again, like, I don't know if – it's worked out well for me as of today. I'm, I'm doing well on rugby league, but I've gravitated towards betting on it because I like watching it. And I'm not sure if that's the most profitable transition. Maybe if I had my time over again, I could sit back and I could pick a sport that is the most exploitable and bet on that instead, not the one that I enjoy the most. But because I'm so qualitative, because I'm not modeling, 
I need to enjoy seeing it on the TV. So that's me with rugby league. Like I just I can't I can't get enough of it. So yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's fair enough. And I think you can also say the same thing about I mean, it depends what kind of person you are, but I would say the same thing about in terms of approaches to betting too. Like if you told me you're either going to be a, you know, a, if you're going to be a 5% winner on the UFC, if you do what I'm doing now and like watch tape and et cetera, et cetera, or you're going to be a 10% UFC better if you model it, I would take the 5% because I would yeah. really hate my life throughout the week, like modeling just because yeah. I would hate looking at spreadsheets all week. It would do my absolute head in. So. Yeah, and you've got to enjoy it. You've got to enjoy it, man. And yeah. like, you, you, like, you know, you've got to have that yipping Yahoo moment when a player you've back scores in the corner or like if you've backed someone via submission and they, you know, cinch in a das yeah. or something like that. Like <laughs> those those moments where you're, you're clapping and you're getting – like. Someone like Nishikori has said before on Twitter, like, you know, the the best bettors are emotionless and they don't get up during upswings. They don't. There is an element of truth to that for sure. And, like, I don't like death riding a lot. Like, if I'm watching a footy match and I have a big bet on a play to score a try and he drops it over the line, you're never going to see me throwing a glass or something like that or even anything. There's barely, there's rarely an audible rarely an audible reaction to what i'm watching but like there will be the odd time where you you sort of get fired up a little bit and 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 you don't have that if you're just punching numbers into a sheet so, <laughs> well, unless you're really stoked about a, a a new um you know factor you've added to your model and you get you think <laughs> about that but no not really yeah so what um what kind of markets are you betting on the nrl i can probably add a bit bit more to this discussion because yeah my, myself also nrl is probably my favorite sport too so i know exactly what markets you're going to be talking about <laughs> the markets that i have a passion for and that i can talk about until the cows come home are any time try scorer markets and it's a market that some people maybe turn their nose up as far as legitimacy but as far as i'm concerned you can get set for good volume you can go down to the tab machine and, and the machine will bet you 2k on a game day you know, using someone like Xavier Coates as an example, if you want to go bet him at a dollar eighty thirty minutes from the off, you can just press. You can get on for big volume. Like I can get on to win more, way more on try scorers game day than what I can to win an early tennis head to head. So it's any and, and and due to that, Phil, I've not needed to think. Well, I'm going to reinvent myself and I'm going to be a sides better. Why? For what reason? It's not as fun. I enjoy doing the form more for try scorers and um, I get set for plenty of volume. Um, so I'm just full steam ahead. This year, I bet a lot of a lot of sides and totals. I won at a great clip on match totals and I lost at a diabolical clip on sides and it pretty much eat, like on, on handicaps and head to head. So I think there's an edge there with the totals, but my focus, man, is just anytime try scorers. That's it. Cool. Well, let's let's go through your process for any time try scores because I've actually dabbled in that market myself. I had a great year last year and I had a terrible year this year. So I'd love to hear what your process is and uh, obviously not go into your edge too much to give it away. But yeah, what, what kind of things are you looking for, um, I guess, to gain an edge? I'm, I'm looking for players that haven't scored much yet that are probably going to score soon. Okay. So... The, the, and, and and when I say oh, I'll try to use I'll try to use examples. Okay, he, here's a good example. Um, I talk I talk a lot about utilization, expected tries, line breaks generated, players who look really good to put it very colloquially, and are running really hard and are breaking a lot of tackles, but just aren't quite scoring. When odds makers make prices for try scorers. I would wager that the majority of the factors that they use are pure strike rate, which means how many matches, obviously team total and all that stuff is reflective in the price they make and the match script and the handicap. You know, if Storm's negative 16 and a half, the second row is going to be sub $3 to score. But guys who are right there have a lot of opportunities, have a lot of expected tries, line breaks, but aren't quite scoring. Someone like Britton Nickera. So I don't know if anyone knows. There'll be guys watching this laughing because I have an NRL group and all I do Every week, he's just praised Britton Nicara at a really irrational like level. I just love him so much, right? He went through a streak of like six or seven games this year and he hadn't scored a try. Um, and he finished the season just scalding hot. He's someone who plays on a good attack. He plays on a right edge outside. 
Braden Trindle and Nico Hines, whoever's floating over there, he gets quality ball. He's extremely athletic. He plays 80 minutes and he doesn't have a high susceptibility to injury. Guys like that, law of averages are going to pop up. But when they haven't scored in six or seven games, the house likes to roll them out to a price that isn't really, you know, acceptable. There's all these little, there's all these little like storylines like that throughout the course of a season where like I'd rather back back a player in game five where he hasn't scored in four than back him to score for his fifth game in a row. That makes sense, right? Yeah, 100%. Of, co- of course, of course, though, there are instances where someone like Alex Johnston, left winger for the South Sydney Rabbitohs, has scored in four games to start the season, and you're back into scoring game five at $1.90 just because he is just getting so much ball. There's so much traffic. There's so much design stuff going to his side that you've just got to keep backing him. But I think that the most success I've had is where I've looked at a player, I've eyeballed the skill set, I've eyeballed the utilization, the opportunities, and I'm I'm backing them because they haven't scored yet, but my goodness, are they close to scoring. Paul Alamotti is another really good example, left center for the Penrith Panthers. He came in about halfway through the year when Tail and May got injured. Um, he wasn't wanted at his previous club. There was a bit of a question mark about his ability, but you put on the tape, and in his first game, he he's moving well, foot speed looks great, he's evasive, and he's going up prices way bigger than Isaac Tungo, the opposite centre, because he's less accomplished. But he looks better, and he's come out, and he's, he's basically had a, you know, a, a life-changing run in, in the postseason, and people who were watching Paul Alamotti saw that coming because of how well he actually looked. The tries weren't there yet. The realised, like the actual tries weren't there yet, but but they were coming. And people who don't watch rugby league cannot make assessments like that of players. They just can't. They, right. can, look at the, they can look at the strike rate. They can look at how often a left winger scores against a particular right side defence. They can isolate all of these factors that you can certainly win off against a relatively exploitable market like the try score market. But I think where where I have the point of difference is just understanding what, what makes a quote unquote good footy player. And and that's what rugby league tragics like me are able to um sort of highlight, I think. That's that's the advantage I have for watching so much footy and, and just figuring out which players are going to be scoring tries, which players are talented. It's interesting because I would have thought your edge, or at least anyone's edge in a anytime try scorer market, would be more um, team based or like matchup based. I guess. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. For example, last year or the last two years, I've been like, I guess, measuring like what percentage of tries are scored on what side of the park for. For sure. But, yeah, for, for for certain teams and defensively too. So, I mean, for example, that's, that's, like last that's part of it. Yeah, last year. Um, I backed uh, as a Titans fan. I watch every single game, and I backed opposition fullbacks, front rowers, anyone who was trucking up the middle of the field. Or what? <laughs> yeah, well, I don't uh, like to back against them, mate. But as as the Titans attack last year, they uh, all left most left side dominant. Left. Yeah, mate, it's, so it's backed, incredible. I know. So I backed uh, Lofty Khan. He was his debut season, so we're not talking yeah. about the price he's going off this year. No, but last he was year, odds it was against. Ridiculous. It was he was two bucks twenty for like fifteen games in a row. I felt like last year, and even someone like Brian Kelly, like Brian Kelly, as a standalone talent, I wouldn't say is an above average athlete, but because he is the beneficiary of so much right to left stuff on that team, you're just going to pop up. I always talk about that um, in my WhatsApp group. I always say someone like Kyle Ido, the left center for Cronulla, he hadn't scored in like eight games, not because he's not good, not because he's not getting the ball, because he's been unlucky. If there's enough traffic down your side of the field and you're, you are standing in a meaningful like spot on the field as left center, you're going to pop up. You're going to score tries. So you have to ignore those cold streaks sometimes. But yeah, great example you used. With the Titans left side, they're super left side dominant. I think they still are this year to a smaller degree. I think it evened yeah. up a lot. Um, but for example, another good example is the Warriors. They have a really unique way of generating line breaks and try scoring opportunities throughout the middle of the field. Starts with Adam Fanua Blake, but also is a byproduct of forwards finding their front, playing the ball quickly. And Wade Egan, their dummy half, just generally being very opportunistic as far as giving good balls to big guys under the post. Like, they do it more than anybody. The Dolphins started the year doing it a lot as well. But picking up on things like that, right, the data will tell you that Team A is scoring a lot in the middle of the field. But also, if you watch all the games, you can see that it's not by chance. 
you can see that it's because they're, they're making a concerted effort to target that area of the field. So there's there's a it's still a pretty technical process and there's still like 15 or 20 boxes you've got to tick before you make a bet. But I'd say the most interesting one, uh, certainly the one that you just mentioned and, and, and what I spoke about before. Yeah, so in terms of getting down on these markets you mentioned, you can get down good amounts at the tab uh, on game day. And I've certainly experienced that too in, in certain accounts where – I can remember this previous season I had a Ladbrokes account and if I'd bet, um, you know, three days beforehand, they'd only let me have Goodbye. maybe a couple, 500 bucks maybe. I mean, that's that's, that's, that's at account. the maximum. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Whereas if I'd go and bet on game day, I I mean, I don't even know what the limit was because every time I'd punch in, you know, Didn't thousands of it. dollars at some point, it would it'd just go straight through. So you're like, all right. That's um, they're obviously a lot more confident in their model when it comes yeah. to game day. Do you think um, how does your edge, or I don't know if you've measured this or not, but how does your edge compare um, what they come out on normally like a Tuesday night or a Wednesday yeah. morning compared so we, to the day? Yeah, so we, we, we will have betting sessions like a couple of mates and myself where we will bet on a Tuesday night and we'll bet to win, you know, a, a thousand or two thousand or whatever, and we'll, we'll settle for that. And the EV on the, that type of um, I just lost you for a second there. Yeah, no, I'm still here. Sorry, mate. <laughs> he's he's returned. The EV on a on a session like that over a long period of time is probably about fifteen percent POT. Like it's just very very easy to bet on opening prices. You get get closer to game day, and that EV, I think they expect a POT. I think with us down to probably about five or six. I haven't. I, I do have a metric on my sheet: game day versus early. I haven't looked at it. Uh, enough yet because I'm still betting like there's specific championships coming up on Friday. Um, I'm going to keep betting on footy and then I'll have probably a week or two where I really look at it. But sure, it's certainly harder to beat on game day. But obviously, you know, value is is what price times volume or whatever. So if you can, if you can actually get those big amounts down on game day at an expected of five or six percent, like you're still going to be doing pretty well. But yeah, it's like really clueless prices on that teamless Tuesday. And they get they get progressively less clueless up to kickoff. But the limits are still respectable the whole way through. What I will mention, what I will mention is that a large part of my turnover on um Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, whatever is on Bet365 and TAB, which comes with an asterisk, as you would know. Um um, because you know the former bookie, it it, it 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 does get difficult to get on, but it all comes down to being resourceful and and hustling and stuff like that. But um, yeah, I, I'm confident that the try score is at least in the near future is something that I'll always be able to bet successfully on, unless they strip the market percentages next year. Who knows what they're yeah. going to do? But it's, it's good. It's good yeah. going at the moment. Yeah, no, it's all super interesting, man. It's um, it's it's. I think people uh, uh, diss the prop market a lot because they just, uh, you know, they don't really know that much about it and they assume that, you know, obviously compared to the major market stuff, you can't bet as much. But for guys that are either beginning origination or even guys that uh, bet full time, you can get thousands of dollars down on this market and that's all you need to make a full-time can, income off sports you, betting. Yes, you're not going to be the next Tony Bloom or Matthew Benham or bloody Zelko Renegadic, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> not, No, nah, not not quite for sure. Like, there's, Well, it's hard to get there without, yeah. I mean, you've got NBL for horse racing and then you've got APL, which is just super, super liquid. But like, there, there's no pro punter that I know that would turn their nose up at a 5K feel on game day. Like, that's 5K, like. Like it's and like player props. Like if you go and you try and bet, you, you could you could have ten k on Jalen Hurts over two hundred and seventy five passing yards NFL game day props. Like props are becoming super legitimate compared to what they used to be, right? Yeah, like yeah, in the bigger sports, obviously UFC is still a work in progress, um, probably <laughs> for li for limits. But yeah, like I think props are pretty pretty fair game now. No, I mean I th I mean UFC you could. I mean, days before you can get thousands down. Like, yeah. it's, it's. I would say it's it's probably like a similarish kind of market to any time try score That's in handy. terms of liquidity. Like, there's, yeah. um, yeah, there's there's yeah. I think, like you said, there's no issues with with a lot. You know, as long as it's a big sport, the prop markets are are a really good starting point for for anyone who wants to begin origination. And I think even like 
if you if I was a uh, if I was telling if you were starting originating today and you said I'm going to start with NRL pro uh, sorry NFL props I would almost go maybe that's a little go bit a bit lower sharp. yeah yeah go, you can go yeah. Lower. So, Just pump the brakes yeah, yeah pump the brakes yeah <laughs> almost really like yeah like I've 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 had a bit of involvement with the NFL uh, player props and um they're no joke man like they're hard and like the level of sophistication behind american football modeling is much higher than rugby league for an array of different reasons uh but yeah if someone said hey game um you know day one punter i'm gonna start betting over under rushing yards i'd be like well buckle up because <laughs> yeah. it's, <not> <laughs> it's not gonna be easy like no, it's no, no. yeah yeah start with the significant strikes mate <laughs> yeah liter literally that's it um mate i was gonna ask you I guess I was, I wouldn't say suspicious, but I'm always suspicious of people who are betting quantitatively on two sports at the same time because I Quali assume that it's... Qual qualitatively. Sorry, sorry, qualitatively. Yeah. Uh, on two sports at the same time, qualitatively can be very time-consuming. But yeah. I think speaking with you today, it sounds like you've got a... It's not like you're spending your whole day is watching every game of tennis and obviously it's eight games a week of rugby league is nothing crazy. So I think, can you sh shed a bit on how, like, I guess oh, over time, maybe you've been able to do it in terms look, of betting two uh, sports at the same time. A lot. Of, uh, and again, like I've taken a step back with tennis and I do a lot of paper trading with tennis and I'll have weeks where I don't make a tennis bet at all. Um, like I would consider myself, today a predominantly a rugby league uh, rugby league punter from a try scoring standpoint a bit of this and a bit of that and tennis it's my passion i still pay per trade i still watch it i still think i can make an earn from it i did a lot of leg work in as i said like 2019 2020 2021 where i was watching so much and i feel like there's still a lot of knowledge that's carried over from that period of time and rugby league it's been a, a lifelong passion of mine to watch that um, but don't get me wrong, man. The schedule is still pretty rigorous. Like I'm still at the desk a lot. I've still got film on a lot. Like it's not something that you can sort of just do for a few hours a day and hope to attain really good results. Like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still absorbing, you know, like easy 40 hours a week worth of tennis and, and rugby league stuff, um, yeah. per week, which is expected for, a, for a job. But, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's cool off a little bit as I've, I suppose wise and, and I've I've gotten better at managing outlay as well and not um I suppose not placing that many bets anymore. Like I'm a little bit less of an action junkie is what I was back in the day. It comes with discipline and stuff like that. So no nah, man, like it's 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 a busy workload, but it's it's manageable. Like we're punters, so like would would we have it any other way? Like probably yeah. not. Yeah. <laughs> um why I noticed that you're you're, you're tipping uh, your NRL stuff and also uh, you're on Pickio or whatever the other platforms there are for yeah. tennis. Um, what made you decide to start sharing your bets rather than just keeping them to yourself? It's a good question, and you, you've got to answer it on, honestly and say there's always an element of ego there. There's always an element of hey, um, I would like other people to be impressed with what i'm doing and it's not a pretty answer but i think a lot of people i i think i'm quite low on the ego um spectrum compared to what i used to be like i used to be a big hey ha look at this i'm winning on betting but i think the people who do more of that are actually <laughs> are actually worse you know does that make sense like you know you see tw twitter's just like a cesspool of just egotistical like handicappers who are just posting hey just went seven and oh and then you'll follow their stuff for a month and they'll be down 500 units like that that like it i've sort of met myself in the middle um but, but but what i do honestly really like to do is i actually like to help people because like in australia obviously we've got all of this gross per capita data about how um how much we gamble right and there are a lot of habits that people fall into and a lot of money is lost just by lack of knowledge. And I've got nearly 200 people in this NRL group that I run on WhatsApp. 
and you can put the link somewhere. I've got no issue with that. Um, and I reckon at least 50 of them I've had conversations with about what to do and what not to do. Like the the way that advertising steers people into same game multis without the punter actually realizing what kind of a margin is built into that product and that it is, it is basically impossible to win long-term betting same game multis. But that... You know, like you, when you go to school, you have classes about drugs, you have classes about sex. Like, oh, I want my teacher telling, I want my son's teacher saying in year five, hey, brother, you know, Jimmy, if you try to bet same game multis, you know, the, <laughs> the odds are stacked against you. B- because we don't get any of that. We're just, we've got all this advertising thrown in our face and people are always asking me, hey, you know, do you recommend a same game multi for this match? I'm like, I never would. And they're like, why? I'm like, well, here's why. Like, I don't do that just for the, for the F of it. Like, there is an element of, hey, yep, I'll put this... Post up, I'm doing well, I'm winning here in the WhatsApp group, but also ask me a question and I'm happy to help you out. I'm happy to exchange um, content with you or, or, or whatever. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's a little bit of showboating, but I think today it's it's more so just to involve myself in the community. It's good to build connections as well. And yeah. I, I really do like helping people. Like, when, when I, yeah, well, I've, I've got, yeah, I've got a lot of people that I, that I chat to on a daily basis and a lot of them I'm sort of mentoring or helping a little bit, which I really like to do. So, because people did it to me. So yeah. and pe- people still do it to me. That's never going to stop. Like I'm as I, as you said before, I'm not, you know, Jelco. I've obviously, but I'm somewhere in the middle now where I, I can start to give advice to people who really don't have a clue what they're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, mate. That's uh, no. I understand, it, and it's great that you're honest about it because I think uh, I think a lot of people like to ignore the fact that a lot of it can be ego, just deciding to tip, um, and that yeah, that they are, you know, they try and lie and say that. You know, they're trying to, like you just said, <clears throat> and I believe you, but I think people will just say, yeah, no, I want other people to be able to beat the bookmakers as well, which is obviously a good thing and people probably want that to happen, but I do think a lot of it is it is ego-based. And well, the, I don't, yeah. the reason why it's probably clearer to see that I'm telling the truth is because I don't have anything to, like, at least financially to gain from. Like, I gave out, and sure, it's possible in the future um people have to pay for access to my things i never know what kind of a turn i'm going to take as far as is the edge sustainable do i need less people following my stuff but this year the whatsapp group that i that i ran didn't cost a penny any all my mates could join and every week every tuesday game day audio explanations like it was an extremely comprehensive service and it didn't cost anyone a penny yeah and there's no way i would do that or any human being i would have thought could do that without having some level of care for the for the for the consumer 100%. So that that's where I fall back and I say, well, yeah, I I, I didn't earn a, a penny from any of my NRL stuff this yeah. year. I just pumped it out. And I gave away commentary that I probably shouldn't have as far as, you know, speaking about edges and stuff like that. But um, it's just, it's fun. Like I like doing it and I like helping helping out most of those people who are my mates. So um, yeah, that's, that's the answer to that. Yeah, cool, mate. Uh, last thing I wanted to talk about, and I'm sorry for taking up so much time, that's right. um, was your use of trade mate sports, which is pretty mm-hmm. rare that we get a, I guess, a professional sports better on uh, that is also using trade mate sports themselves. Um, tell me a little bit about how you use it because I think it's super interesting that you use it in a way that is basically completely different from the standard trade mate sports user. Yeah. So obviously, like, I like. You know, there's there's two types of betting, to put it in a real simple way, I guess. There's originating and there's steam chasing, right? So if, if I place a bet on, like, Chilean second division football, you can be pretty sure that I'm not originating my, the, pri- the prices for that match. It's information that, that, that may come from the trade mate feed or any number of things that's floating around out there. Um, but, like, I think the function of trade mate for somebody who is only – how do I say this? It's 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 difficult to frame. I mean, I, I the, the the tool that I use a lot on TradeMate is actually figuring out what is the real time versus closing edge of the bets that I place. Because if you go to TradeMate and you look in the trade feed, there'll be all of these suggested bets to make based on the discrepancy from soft book A to sharp book. That, that, that's about right, isn't it? Just yeah. it, it, it alerts you of off market selections, right? Correct. Um but the majority of my turnover doesn't actually come from the recommended trade mate trades. But what trade mate will do, even if it's not a bet generated by the trade feed, 
you can plug any bet in there. I can actually plug a rugby league bet into Trade Mate, or at least I'm pretty sure you guys have got rugby league at Trade yep. Mate. And it'll tell me what my Canterbury Bulldogs plus six and a half at a dollar ninety edge is alongside the real time market. And that's actually not that easy to find a tool that will do that. And if you don't have access to a Pinnacle account, which Aussies don't legally anyway, you can't have a logged in funded Pinnacle account to check. You never know if Odds Portal is right. Pinnacle's often stale if you're not logged in. What TradeMate will do is if you're a subscriber, it will just give you a real time edge of your wager and you can follow that edge from three hours from the off all the way up to kickoff. So so even if I'm not making the bets from the TradeMate trade feed, all of these uh, wages that I'm pulling in from different spaces, I always enter them into TradeMate because I find TradeMate to be really good telling me what my edge is against against the market. You can monitor the benchmark and stuff like that. And also the data tool on TradeMate is any punter gets excited about a graph, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, it's like it's like chart porn. The TradeMate chart is really good. And, you know, it'll tell you, people really need to understand that, um, you know, with, with TradeMate, like uh, the, your expected value is is more indicative, at least in the short term of your, your actual results. So the focus on TradeMate for me is always to get that green line, that expected going up and, you um, Usually, once the sample gets big enough, the actual line is going to be pretty pretty close to where that that expected line is. So mm-hmm. those two tools I use a lot for trade. Mate. I'm not actually using, I'm not actually taking the trades. I'm not copying the trades very often from trade. Mate, yeah. But the little tools on the side, very sophisticated, like legitimate and helpful for me. So that's that's and even my tennis stuff, right? Like I remember for a period of time where I really thought that I was like incapable of betting on tennis, like last year. I was doing my life over like a sample of 100 or 200. And when I say that, that's just a, it's a hyperbole for punters. <laughs> you, you know, you, you're losing lots of money. Um, I started paper trading my tennis bets into trade, mate, just for $1 a bet. And that way I was able to figure out if the tennis stuff that I was, was placing was winning against the close. And uh, you don't need to go to Old Sport or go to no. a stale pinnacle account to figure that out. So that's a long winded answer, but, but yeah, that's how I that's basically how I use trade mate um today. And I, I, I pluck a bit of stuff from the trade feed as well, but not yeah. that often. No, it's super interesting just to um I think just to share that with everyone that that you know is listening and that uses trade mate or has thought about using it um or used it in the past, that um obviously most people subscribe so they get tips tips they get, yeah they get, they get bets to bet on yeah yeah it's yeah, yeah. an incredible I, I know people say i'm biased but i don't think there's well, a i'm better, not uh, yeah and i'm <laughs> saying think, it yeah exactly i don't think there's um i know it's a hefty price to to pay for just a, a tool i guess like to to a, a market reading tool but um there are certainly um i would say you know, wealthy people out there that could use that tool and pay that subscription, like you know, like it's you know, like it wouldn't cost them much. It would be a, you know, a bit of a what do you call it, a drop in the ocean or drop. whatever. Yeah, well, if you're full, <laughs> if you're a full time punter, like it's it, it's it's it's, I mean, pricey is relative, but like I would suggest that if you're a full time punter and you're betting on obscure leagues, whether it's from Trade Mate or from anywhere else. You can get bang for your buck just out of the um, the data tools, like uh, and the chart and the EV, and seeing a real time edge for the trade that you make, all that sort of stuff. Like I think yeah. that's what I think that's worth it on its own. Yeah, because if you uh, there are other t- uh, tracking tools out there. If you just wanted to track your bets with with Trade Mate, um, sorry, yeah, with with any tool really. Um, and I know there's some good ones out. Like I, I like Betstamp, but and I use Betstamp, but their like calculation of CLV is like it's not worth even looking at. For example, whereas at least in Trade Mate, you know that the CLV is always going to be, you know, off a sharp bookmaker. Whereas a lot of their CLV is just based on the what was the highest price at close, and that could be the highest price at like a soft book. Yeah, any That's any junk. book. You don't want that. Yeah, exactly. So, um, 
and and there's obviously other tools out there too that calculate closing EV. And I know this is just gonna you know sound like I'm I'm plugging trade mate. And I wouldn't eat, like for for a beginner better. I wouldn't say don't, <laughs> don't uh, just subscribe to trade mate to to track your bets. Like get the full uh, set day yeah. one. Just pay for it all. <laughs> exactly. I wouldn't don't say worry about your bankroll. That. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I would never say to do that. But I think for someone who's got a sizable bankroll. <clears throat> Yeah, like yourself, guys, you know, who've got even bigger bankrolls, I would say that um, it's an incredibly powerful tool to uh, to do a lot of things, <laughs> a lot of things that I'm sure, you know, you're not sharing with women and I don't want you to share uh, with just because that's your edge. But, um, yeah, if you use your imagination, there's a lot of things you can do with tools like that that are um, that are more than just what the trade feed tells you to bet on. So Yeah, well, a good a good bet. A bet that's a good bet three hours from the off oftentimes is a different degree of good or even bad at the off. Yeah. And checking that, validating that without a tool like what TradeMate has is extremely time consuming. Yeah. So it will just monitor the live edge that you have on a particular wager and that will be dynamic from when you place the bet all the way until the off. Yeah. And that is worth the money to know if it just tells you that if if what you're betting on is 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 the right stuff basically yeah no 100 percent. i yeah. agree mate um that is the end of uh all the questions i've got for you today mate i uh yeah i'm very uh i'm it was it was great talking to you about your processes with you know tennis rugby league and and also at the end there with trade mate where can um where can people find you uh, maybe people want to join your your WhatsApp group, or they want to jump onto your Picio or anything, mate. Plug whatever you want. <laughs> nah, j just um, at J Humphreys28, H U M P H R E Y S on Twitter or X. If you go there, there's links peppered everywhere. I won't verbally mention all this stuff here, but there's WhatsApp links, there's a Picio link where I track all my, my tennis uh, sides. That's going at about uh, I just started doing that recently, about 300 trades ago. It's going at about 5%, which isn't a big enough sample size, but it's better than being negative 5%. And I'm always posting it. But yeah, literally, I'm always, <laughs> you don't say. Or No, nah, because it's so funny because like the general public is just always so skeptical of, of, of tennis stuff. It's like, what's your sample size? You know, all that commentary. So you just sort of protect yourself. Uh, but yeah, like all my PGO stuff's on there, always posting analysis and then links to my nrl whatsapp group um will be about on my on my uh, x page as well so just go there and and just get amongst it because i'm just always posting punting stuff we live for it so that's where to go yeah yeah you also posted a great detailed um uh i guess starting 17s for the NRL oh. size next year which i had a quick look at and uh i uh, i i always feel sorry for people that do that because there's just there's just no way you can post exactly what people want to hear. <laughs> nah, it, it, it took that. That took me like a day. Yeah, I can because imagine. like I I had to make sure that it was somewhat sound reasoning and in line with what would actually happen. And then like the first comment you get is never a pat on the back. It's always like yeah. you know, like are you on crack? Why have you got this person here? And I'm like, brother, like I I didn't get the Cowboys bench rotation correct, but like just just give me a spell. But yeah, I love stuff like that. That's the cause. And just for the record, like I'm a journalist by trade, so I I finished a degree of journalism and uh, sports study. So a, I'm a sports journalist by trade, effectively. So there's not that many things I can do well, but I think like you know, writing and communicating sports stuff is something that I, that I can do. So go to the go to the Twitter page, and there's a bit of that happening. So yeah. Awesome stuff, mate. It's been an absolute Matt. pleasure having you on. And thanks, everyone, for listening. Please, if this is your first time watching or listening to the podcast, do a quick rate and review of the podcast and subscribe to us on YouTube or wherever you listen to the podcast. And uh, we spoke about it briefly today, but if you are looking to implement any of the strategies we talked about regarding TradeMate Sports, you can always start a free week trial of TradeMate Sports at tradematesports.com. Thanks very much again, Jake. And I'm sure, mate, we'll get you on again sometime to maybe we can delve a little bit deeper into the into the rugby league and the tennis because I'm sure uh, there's a lot more to talk about than yeah. This maybe in, in the lead up to in the lead up to next year's NRL season or or something or something like that. 
Yeah, as long as people are interested. Unfortunately, there's a lot well, of true. fans yeah, on no. this channel. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't imagine they're, you know, watching the South Sydney Rabbitohs in Scandinavia, <laughs> but you never know. Exactly, anyway. mate. <laughs> All right, catch cool. you later, mate. Cheers, mate. See ya. 